We've talked before about how Mithril was going to be this giant leap forward in proof of stake and how it was going to bring us the trustlessness of full node wallets with the ease of use of light wallets, the best of both worlds. Now we even know how it works. Get ready. Let's go. Professor Agalos Kiaias does a great job. I mean, tremendously great job of explaining complex cryptographic systems to non-cryptographers like myself. He does a really good job in this video. And for all you neckbearded basement dwelling dungeon masters, I will have you know there is no variety of elf involved in this whatsoever. Here's the problem we're solving, guys. In order to combine this trustlessness we get in full node wallets with the ease of use and convenience of light wallets, you have to solve the problem of bootstrapping. You need fast bootstrapping. So we could do this in proof of work. In proof of work, we've got block headers and block headers can allow you to bootstrap quickly. In proof of stake, block headers won't do it because you need info about stakeholder distribution to confirm block validity. Makes sense, right? If uh, you're validating blocks based on people staking their coin holdings, you need to know about those, those staked coin holdings in order to confirm the validity of the block. No shocker here, Mithril fixes this. Mithril is a cryptographic construction that enables a population of stakeholders to issue a signature on a message. Because after all, a blockchain consensus protocol is really just a system of communication about different parts of the blockchain so that the group can form a consensus about what is validly included in the blockchain. That communication involves messages, in the case of blockchains, typically messages about blocks. In order for Mithril to enable those signatures on messages in the most valuable way, it needs to exhibit three crucial properties. The first of which is that it will only issue the signature from the population of stakeholders if a certain threshold ratio of that population is met. For example, half of the population of stakeholders or two thirds of the population of stakeholders. Unless that ratio is met, it won't issue the signature. And just like in regular multi-sig, you're going to have pre-signature fragments. Those pre-signature fragments need to be independently verifiable and publicly aggregated prior to the final signature. So obviously, if you're, if you're creating a signature from an entire population of stakeholders, you're going to have little signature fragments from you know, smaller subunits of that whole population prior to creating the final signature from the entire population. And here, Agalos is telling us those little pre-signature fragments need to be independently verifiable and publicly aggregatable. Finally, it needs to be efficient. The final signature needs to be of constant size and verifying it needs to be logarithmically dependent on the number of stakeholders. So we don't want it to be incredibly more difficult to verify if the number of stakeholders goes up. With Mithril, Cardano has achieved these three crucial properties. And here's how it'll work. There will be Mithril keys and stakeholders will include their Mithril keys along with the normal cryptographic key material they're already using. At regular intervals, full nodes will test whether they can produce a pre-signature fragment. This testing is important because only a random subset of the stakeholders will be eligible to produce a pre-signature fragment. When a sufficient number of pre-signature fragments, remember we said one of the properties was reaching, it, it has to uh, allow for this threshold. So when a sufficient number of pre-signature fragments have been issued by eligible stakeholders, thus achieving the threshold, then it will be possible to aggregate the fragments, remember that has happened publicly, into a final signature. This will be called a checkpoint. And the checkpoint can be verified with respect to previous checkpoints all of which are cryptographic commitments of the relevant unspent transaction outputs. This will go all the way back to the Genesis block. These checkpoints will be trustless, so to trustlessly bootstrap 
a light client, a light wallet, we just need to verify the sequence of checkpoints up to the present time. If that all seemed like a bunch of nonsensical mumbo jumbo, don't worry. There's a great, easily comprehensible explanation that will also go a long ways towards describing why we probably care about this issue more in Cardano than a lot of other blockchains. So let's think about this in terms of fiat, fiat currency, euros, dollars, yen, bot, what have you. So when you log into your bank account, you know, a lot of people obviously are using web interfaces to log into their bank account at their retail banking establishment, you know, Chase Bank, Wells Fargo, whatever. So you log in. I want you to imagine that every time you logged in and you wanted to check out your account balance, your bank account had to access and download a complete record of every single US dollar transaction or Euro transaction or yen transaction that had occurred in the entire world since the last time you opened up and logged into your bank account. This is not feasible, right? I think we can all understand when you get to that level of volume, when we're talking about that many transactions, the lag time for your device to download every single transaction that had occurred in like USD since the last time you opened your account is not workable. It's not practical. This is too much data and you don't want to wait that long. You just want to look at your account, right? You might want to look at some other things, but you mainly want to look at your account. And this is important for Cardano because we're actually trying to allow nation states to run on Cardano. This isn't a blockchain that's just meant for a bunch of guys to do yield farming in DeFi. You know, like a very, very tiny, tiny, tiny sliver of any nation. We're trying to create a blockchain that'll run a whole nation state. And even when you don't look at uh, a monetary sphere as big as USD or the Euro or the Yen, even if you start talking about much, much smaller countries, the volume of transactions is way, way, way too high to do it like we currently do it in Daedalus. Daedalus is a full node wallet. Daedalus is that equivalent of opening up your bank account web interface and having to download every single transaction that's happened since you last opened it up. You know, it's like, it's like, don't go a couple of days, you know, don't go a week without opening up your bank account because you're going to have to sync all the transactions that have happened in the entire world in your particular fiat currency, right? completely unworkable, even in a very, very small nation state. It's too many transactions. So we need to do it some other way. We can't have each device needing to download the entire blockchain in order for it to be a trustless scenario. We need it to be a light wallet that doesn't have to download the entire blockchain. Just like when you log into Chase Bank, you don't want to download every transaction that's happened in USD since the last time you logged in. We need it to be a light wallet, and that's what Mithril does. Mithril allows you to do something you can't do in your Chase Bank web interface. In your Chase Bank web interface, you have to trust the bank. The bank is telling you the truth about your dollars, right? <laughs> There's so much trust built into the legacy financial system. You don't really care because you're already trusting a million different other things within the system. But with crypto, we care. We want it to be trustless. That's one of the great advantages of blockchain technology that it's trustless. So we need Mithril to do this. And Mithril allows us to have this light wallet experience. Nobody wants to open up and wait for everything to sync. And actually, even if all of us today, because we're such early adopters, are willing to wait for that syncing, once we once we scale up in the ways that Hydra is going to allow, none of us are going to want to sync that much data, right? I mean, it's like it's fine if you're logging if you're jumping in there every single day, but new users are not going to want to sit there and let their their wallet sync for like a day or two. It's just not practical. In a normal crypto ecosystem, 
the entire team of people working on the project would have only been working on smart contracts. Everything would have been Gogan for the last couple of years. They would have been doing, you know, doing nothing but, you know, preparing ultimately for Alonzo. They wouldn't have been working on anything else. Luckily, this is Cardano, where the project is run by a crazy billionaire. And he's had guys like Agalos Kiaias working on a lot of different things, but they were thinking ahead and already working on this issue, already thinking about Mithril. It's all happening in parallel. This is parallel development instead of serialized development. So instead of just finishing smart contracts and then moving on to scaling Hydra and you know fast bootstrapping and light wallets, Mithril, they've been working on all this stuff in parallel. And this is like a golden time in Cardano for all of us because all of these things, you know, sure, Hydra isn't going to be completely built out for a while. Mithril is not going to be completely built out for a while but they already know where they're headed and they've already done all the conceptual work on this stuff. So we already know where we're, where we're going. It's not a big question mark like a lot of these things are in other projects. One of the many reasons it feels good to be in this community. Talk to you tomorrow.